welcome back. In 1948, when the UDHR was being drafted, those involved had agreed that the declaration will need to be reinforced by a covenant. What do we mean by covenant? We mean something that is going to bind on member state. The UDHR itself was seen as an aspiration, as a vision, but they all agreed we needed something stronger, something that will oblige member state to implement the commitment. Negotiations over this covenant took place at the same time as that over the UDHR. But unlike the UDHR, it will take 17 years for the completion of the covenant, a time lapse reflecting increasing international tension, particularly between the two superpowers at the time, the US and the USSR. In this segment, we will review the international context which presided over the development and adoption of the ICCPR, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, and the various debates which characterized the drafting of the provision related to freedom of expression. We will also turn our, our attention to two additional institutions which have made the ICCPR a particularly important tool for the protection of human rights and freedom of expression in particular. So let's begin again with June 1947 when those responsible for drafting the uh, human rights vision for the world agreed that there will be two documents, a declaration highlighting the human rights aspiration and a treaty giving legal force to the vision. At the time, all those involved agreed that the two drafting process will take place at the same time and that the two documents will be adopted at the same time. They could not have been further from the truth. The drafting of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights was actually finalized in 1954. The document was then transferred to the United Nations General Assembly for its adoption. But that is going to take 15 years after a long and arduous journey. Why did it take so long? The international context is the one of the 1950s and 70s. We are in a world in deep and often tragic upheaval. There is the East-West confrontation, the Cold War that is reshaping the world, national boundaries, political blocks are created, all of them at great cost to human beings. There are proxy wars, they multiply around the world, Korea, Indochina, Cambodia, the Berlin Wall is being erected. And then there are the wars of liberation, peoples after people demanding and eventually for the majority of them gaining their independence throughout the 1960s from colonial rule, sometimes after very bloody conflict. Both the Cold War and the wars of decolonization impact very largely on the human rights project in general and the adoption of the covenant in particular. First of all, decolonization transformed the world from a world of empire to a world of sovereign states. There are many more actors involved in drafting, debating, adopting all of those treaties. There are new demands coming up, including very importantly, the principle of self-determination, which is now dominating the human rights agenda and the United Nations agenda. But decolonization is important for one more reason, a critical reason for human rights. It gave meaning to one of the key principles, the most important principle, in fact, at the heart of the human rights vision. All human beings are born and created equal. Had it not been for decolonization, this principle would never have moved from the text to the reality. The ICCPR, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, is finally adopted on December 16, 1968, with 76 member states signing on to it. It becomes effective some 10 years later, in 1976. We are going to look at each paragraph one by one and the debate that took place at the time. The source of our information is a remarkable work done by the scholar Mark Boswit, 
who has gone through thousands of pages of minutes of meetings to piece together the history of the drafting process of the ICCPR. Paragraph 1 of Article 19 of the International Covenant on Civil Political Rights states, everyone shall have the right to hold opinions without interference. So here it's interesting because unlike the UDHR, the ICCPR has a standalone sentence on the right to opinion. In fact, very early on, a distinction is being drawn between expression and opinion. That was already discussed when the UDHR was drafted and it was agreed that in the context of this ICCPR, the difference will be far more marked. All drafters insisted that a distinction needed to be drawn between opinion, which are really thought, and expression, which is the verbalization or the expression of a thought. Everyone discussed and agreed that there was one right which was absolutely unconditional, namely the right to freedom of conscience. It was this right to freedom of conscience which gave the human person his worth and dignity. And therefore that right needed to really be standing alone without connection necessarily to the expression. The drafted did debate whether the interference should just be limited to governmental interference or whether the freedom of opinion should be preserved and protected against any kind of interference. And they very quickly agreed that individuals should be protected against all kinds of interference as far as their freedom of opinion was concerned. What this means, meant at the time and still means now, is that A, no law can regulate opinion or impose opinion or impose limitation on opinion because opinions are thought. And secondly, even in the case of an emergency, the right to freedom of opinion cannot be touched. It cannot be impaired, it cannot be limited. Let's turn our attention now to paragraph two, which is very similar to the UDHR. Everyone shall have the right to freedom of expression. This right shall include freedom to seek, receive, and impart information and ideas of all kind, regardless of frontiers, either orally, in writing, or in print, in the form of art, or through any other media of his choice. That paragraph was also the object of a number of debates. Let me just highlight um, a few that are still relevant today. There was difference of views as to what exactly the scope of freedom of expression entailed. The debate particularly focused on the three verb that you have in that paragraph, seek, receive, and impart. And the key attention was placed on the verb seek. Some states were suggesting that to gather information will be a better formulation because seek could imply unrestrained probing into other people's business. Ultimately though, to seek won the debate. This was an important win because possibly not quite foreseen at the time, the implication is that people have the right to look for information. And that particular verb has become an important normative basis for the right to access information held by government. And we will have some opportunities to discuss that particular right later on in the course. There was some discussion as to whether the use of media should be restricted to lawfully operated media or to licensed media. Indeed, at the time, a number of countries had such system in place. But the proposal was ultimately abandoned. It was felt that the limits to freedom of expression were taken care of by the third paragraph, and we didn't need them in the second. Interestingly, there does not appear to have been discussion around the concept of regardless of frontiers, a notion which I personally find a sign of incredible foresight, as well as the most incredible progressive conception of information, given the times and age. From time to time, regardless of frontiers, was suggested to be deleted, but there was never really any debate. And so we have inherited 
that beautiful um, words in the uh, UDHR and in the ICCPR. Let's now turn to paragraph three, and I'm going to read it, and you can see it on, on your screen. The exercise of the rights provided for in paragraph two of this article carries with it special duties and responsibilities. It may therefore be subject to certain restrictions, but these shall only be such as provided by law and are necessary, a, for respect of the rights or reputation of others, b, for the protection of national security, or of public order, order public, or of public health, or morals. The wording of paragraph 3 is very similar to Article 10 of the European Convention on Human Rights. This is something that we're going to review next. And that European Convention was adopted some 20 years before the ICCPR, the International Covenant. So the similarities are too obvious to be accidental. What were the main points of discussion, though, within the United Nations as far as the limits to freedom of expression was concerned? First, I should say that there were very little debate as to whether or not there should be some limits imposed to freedom of expression. So I think this is something to remember that early on, already uh, throughout the drafting process, there was some agreement that freedom of expression will not be an unconditional right and that limits could be implemented. The debate with regard to the limit first concerned the reference to duties and responsibilities. This is a very interesting reference that you do not find in too many other articles. There were a number of states that opposed the mention of duties and responsibilities on the ground that the purpose of the ICCPR was to lay down rights and the corresponding obligations of state, not to identify the duties of individuals. And indeed that there was no other article in the covenant that included such formulation. Other member states contended that the right to freedom of expression was both precious but also dangerous because of the powerful influence of the media. Ultimately, after some debate, it was agreed that there will be the mention special duties and responsibilities as a way of uh, defining, narrowing, I will say, the scope of those duties and responsibilities. The second debate concerned the restriction themselves. As I mentioned, there was no real debate as to whether there should be restrictions but the nature of those restrictions, the extent of those restrictions, how should they be framed, how should they be listed, all of that was the object of very many debates within the United Nations process. Some member states favored a general wording, something neat, encompassing, while others preferred a full catalog of restrictions one of the drafts submitted included some 30 possible limitations to freedom of expression, a long laundry list of when and how it can be limited. Another less ambitious proposal was to include seven limitations, but let me read a couple of them. Matters which must remain secret in the interest of national safety. Expression which incite others to alter by violence the systems of government. Expression which directly incite persons to commit criminal act. Expression which are obscene. Expression injurious to the fair conduct of legal proceeding. Infringement of literacy or artistic rights, and so on and so forth. So this was a difficult conversation. How? should freedom of expression be limited. And it is also interesting to note that some of those specific restrictions that were put forward in this or another list remain to this day the object of debates and controversies. The advocate of a more general all-encompassing clause argued that a specific list will be far too long and should be included in a separate convention, maybe a convention on information, 
and not on a covenant on civil and political right. Those in support of a long list feared that a general clause could be the object of abusive interpretation and that to be effective at protecting rights, the covenant should set forth in precise and unequivocal terms the permissible limitations to freedom of expression. As you have heard before when I was reading from the code, there were also many debates regarding the limitation to freedom of expression when those expressions incite to war, to crimes, to violence. These were heavily debated throughout the drafting process as well. Ultimately, the adopted formulation reflects a balance between those who favoured a general clause and those who preferred a long list. Although clearly, the formulation is closer to laying down some general principles. What are they? There are three specific principles. Principles of legality, principle of necessity, both of which are quite central to uh, the uh, International Covenant, and you will find reference to them throughout the document. So they are not that specific to freedom of expression. What is specific to freedom of expression is the third principle, which is limitation must be narrowed to specific ground. And these are national security, rights of others, reputation, public health, and public morals. We will analyze those grounds in greater details in the third lesson. For the time being, let's just highlight three main issues. Unlike the UDHR, Article 19 of the ICCPR allows for restriction to the right of freedom of expression. Second, these restrictions have been narrowly defined. Despite all of the debates and the long laundry list that I have shared with you, ultimately, those involved agreed that the restrictions must be narrowly defined. They must be set in law, they must be necessary, and they must be limited to specific issues. National security, rights of others, reputation, public health and public morals. Thirdly and importantly, if you read back at that article and that paragraph, these restrictions are not mandatory. This is the meaning of the verb may. States may or may not impose them. That's an important qualification. And it gives a range of governments the opportunity not to impose such restrictions. Though the restrictions may be imposed, but they are not binding. States do not have to impose such restrictions. Before ending this segment, let me highlight two more aspects of the international covenants which have large implications for the protection of freedom of expression and human rights in general. First, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights as a monitoring body. This is the United Nations Human Rights Committee. It is responsible for overseeing whether member states implement the provision of the International Covenant. It is also its responsibility to issue recommendations toward their implementation. However, its assessment, its observations, are not legally binding, so it does limit very much the impact of that uh, international monitoring body. In addition to reporting on how governments implement their responsibilities, the Human Rights Committee also does something fundamentally important. It issues something called general comment. And if you uh, have gone through your reading list already, you'll know that I have included a couple of general comments in your reading list. What are those? Basically, these are the interpretation of the content of human rights. And they um, set the benchmark. They are a very important summary of where we stand with regard to the protection of a particular human rights. With regard to freedom of expression, the Human Rights Committee has issued two general comments, one of which very recently in 2013, General Comment 34, an excellent overview of the normative understanding of freedom of expression. The second body that is important to uh, the International Covenant and more generally 
to the protection of human rights, to making human rights a, a reality for people on the ground, is a mechanism which allows individuals to file complaints against their own state. That's called the first optional protocol, and it establishes an individual complaints mechanism, allowing you or me to complain to the United Nations about violations of the international covenant by your own state. That optional protocol was adopted by the United Nations General Assembly in December 1966, and it is entered into force 10 years later, in 1976. That's a very important mechanism which people around the world have used. I mean, it, it is a, a slow mechanism by its very nature, but it is very important in that it allows to establish a jurisprudence on the protection of human rights, and in particular, on the protection of freedom of expression. This jurisprudence related to the interpretation and implementation of the covenant, and in particular of freedom of expression, has largely influenced regional human rights court, but also domestic court. It has set standard, it has pushed government to change their laws and change their policies. So this individual complaint mechanism and the Human Rights Committee have played a fundamental role in protecting freedom of expression and making it a living reality in people's life. In conclusion, in this segment, we have reviewed the historical background of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights the background to Article 19 of the ICCPR and the debate that took place over the development of its drafting, highlighting in particular the notion of duties and responsibilities and the permissible limits to freedom of expression. In the next segments, we will turn to regional development as far as the protection of freedom of expression is concerned, beginning with Europe and then moving to Latin America and then Africa.